Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Sober Speak. Uh, once again, at Sober Speak, you will find podcasts of people sharing their story of recovery, much like you would in a, an AA speaker meeting. Uh, these men and women share their experience centered around the 12 steps of recovery. My name's John M. I am an alcoholic, and I will be the host of this episode. Consider this sober speak meeting, if you will, a meeting between meetings, right? We don't want to really replace meetings, but sometimes when you can't get to a meeting, hopefully this will replace it. And I have Miss Megan on today. And then I want to let you all know on the front end of this, we're going to, we're, we're taking a bit of a uh, departure, if you will. Uh, every episode that I've had up to this point has featured somebody uh, within the program uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and their experience uh, around these steps uh, within Alcoholics Anonymous. But tonight, for the first time, we have somebody from the sister group, I guess is what you would call it, of Alcoholics Anonymous, al -Anon. And that's a Miss Megan C. Say hello, Megan. Hi. Thanks, John. <laughs> Welcome. All right. So I am going to let Megan read mm -hmm. from uh, uh, a reading that she has picked out for this evening. And Megan, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you read what you want to read. About. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so this is from one of our pamphlets called A Guide for the Family of the Alcoholic. And um, it starts out by saying this. The family's best defense against the emotional impact of alcoholism is to gain knowledge of this disease and achieve growth and emotional maturity and courage needed to put it into effect. Even individuals who assist alcoholics and their families can become confused and destructive if a member of their own family is an active alcoholic. This is especially true if the drinker is the husband, wife, parent, or child. That That's from um, A Guide for the Family of the Alcoholic. And so what's the name of that book again? A Guide for the Family of uh, yeah, the a guide, a guide for the Family of the Alcoholic. So it's just one of our um one of our pamphlets that we hand out um at meetings. And this was one of the ones I got right when I began the program. Uh, and I love it. Well, um I'm gonna read a couple more things here and we'll get right into your story. <laughs> so we welcome all of your comments. And you can get in touch with us at SoberSpeak.com. Just click on the Contact Us tab, and we will welcome your feedback. Uh, SoberSpeak is a self-supporting organization through our own contributions. We are not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. We do not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorse nor oppose any causes. Please remember, we do not. Speak for any 12-step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Please take what you want and kick the rest out to the curb. So, first thing I want to ask you about, Miss Megan, is um, what you just read there. Why it's important to you. What you've gained through it, uh, what you've gained out of it over the years, and uh, what it means when you hand it out to somebody new in the program. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I first of all, I think this is really special. So thank you for having me on. This is really exciting for me. Um, I just have one Al Anon joke, which probably isn't even funny, but um, <laughs> so <laughs> I've just, I just heard a speaker say it once, and I thought it was funny, but she said, um, you know, between our 12 steps and your 12 steps, there's only one word that's different. And the word is, um, instead in the 12th step, uh, it says that you carry the message to other alcoholics and we just carry it to others. And, um, she said, it's because, um, we've carried enough messages to alcoholics, so we don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, <laughs> You know, and I and I got to tell you, you know, Al-Anon has always had a very dear place in my heart because the group that I got sober in, mm -hmm. uh, well, we would. So it, this is how it was set up a lot back in the day, so to speak. I don't know if all the groups are still this way, but there was usually a an AA 
meeting room, which was usually the bigger room just because there's more of us. And then there was a smaller room off to the side, which was the Al-Anon room, right? And so we would, and we a lot of times had meetings at the same times. And so I got to know a lot of the Al-Anons very well. And I can remember going in there Mm -hmm. to the Al-Anon room and saying, hey, uh, I just got back from seeing the new Al-Anon movie. And they say, what? I said, well, you know, uh, sleeping with the enemy. (laughs) That's awesome. awesome. Right. And then they would look up at me and they say, hey, hey, John, uh, you know what you call uh, an Al-Anon without an asshole? Oh, what's that? It's a single. (laughs) So I've never heard. So anyway, we 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 had a good time going back and forth. And uh, but anyway, Al-Anon and the whole program in general had always a very dear uh, place in my heart. And, um, so, okay, we digress, but that's okay. That's a good thing. Um, so let's go back to that reading and what you, uh, thought about that, uh, why it was important to you. I, the reading's important to me because, um, a lot of times people, and even actually when I started Al-Anon, I thought that I was going to just get uh, pointers on how to stop my husband from drinking or how to fix it because I had tried everything I knew. And so I had Googled over and over again how to get my husband to stop drinking and Al-Anon kept <laughs> popping up. So finally I went, um, I thought that I'd have to maybe. So, so this is a phenomenon. Let, yes. let me just stop you there yes. because I, I do hear about this, right? Yeah. About people because uh, I hear people come into Alcoholics Anonymous and they say, yeah, my wife or my husband was Googling all the time how to get me to stop. So what happens when you go to these sites? I mean, what what is the mindset when you're going through that process? Uh, the mindset is like desperation. And um, it's a lot of it is um, at the point where I'm finally asking for anonymous help on the Internet. I have already been through, you know. It, it, the mindset is fear and desperation. Um, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I didn't know alcoholism was a disease at all. I thought that he was yeah. just, you know, uh, just I thought a couple of things. I thought that um, he wasn't stopping because he was being mean to me. I thought that he wasn't stopping because I wasn't good enough. Uh, and sometimes he would say that, you know, so, so for me, so, yeah. well, help me with that. When you say you weren't good enough, help, yeah. help me to understand, that. Oh. you know, because I'm so used to seeing it from an alcoholic's perspective, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just what I live in. It's in my bones. It's kind of what I do on a day-to-day basis. But right. from your perspective and you're here, what, what do you mean you weren't good enough? What does that mean? Uh, well, for me, I think it means for a good portion of my life, I had a, a good success rate of getting things to happen the way that I wanted them to happen. And I, you know, I think we're all in the same culture. So I always thought that the love of a good woman would make somebody change and be better. And if, if what I was doing wasn't working, then there must be something wrong with me. Um, yeah, I know it's not, it's very strange, but this took a lot of work to figure out, by the way, it didn't just come to me overnight, but lots of, lots of meetings and and outside help to get there. But yeah, so that's why at the reading that I picked, I love because it starts out by saying the family's best defense against the emotional impact of alcoholism is to gain knowledge of the disease and achieve growth and emotional maturity and courage needed to put it into effect. So I needed to gain knowledge of this disease that I didn't know was a disease. I really Mm -hmm. thought it was something he was doing wrong or I was doing wrong. And I was bound and determined to make it stop somehow um, and I had banged my head up against the same walls over and over and over and over again. You know, I did everything that we do. I yelled, I cried, I pleaded, I get the silent treatment. I did everything I could think to do except for, you know, really confront it for what it was, which was a disease. And once I started learning, which is a slow, slow process and, 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 and figuring out that this wasn't good or bad, it was just sick and well, you know, that really helped me. That gave me the emotional maturity and courage needed, but it's it takes like a daily basis for me. I have to touch the program every day to remind myself to do certain things to continue on my path to recovery from the effects of alcoholism for me. 
Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So let's all, let's dive a little bit into your story. So tell me, like, you know, uh, just a, a brief snapshot of where you grew up, you know, uh, possibly some things you may think of that uh, contributed to uh, your choice of mates as you were moving up in this world. You know, I always say that uh, um, when people come into AA, you know, and they want to go to the AA dances and the Al-Anon dances and all that sort of stuff, I'm thinking, yeah, just strap on your wacko magnet <laughs> and just go out there and try to <laughs> find whoever you need to find. So tell me w- tell me where you grew up, you know, uh, whatever you want to tell me about that, what you think may have led you into choosing the mate you choose and the type of lifestyle that you ended up leading. Eventually. Oh, my gosh. Okay, this will be fun. So I am. Um, okay. So I actually did not grow up with um, alcoholic parents. I actually never, ever think I saw them drink alcoholically. Um, they, let me see, uh, there's one can of beer we had in our refrigerator growing up. And uh, it was a, in 1986. And the Red Sox were supposed mm-hmm. to win the World Series that year. And my dad mm-hmm. bought like one beer to celebrate it. Uh, but they didn't end up winning. And so... <laughs> so that one can of beer like lasted until 2004 when they actually, and I don't think he drank it, but that was my experience with alcohol growing up. Um, oh. Yeah. But I later learned that um, my parents made a decision not to drink in front of their us because they both had um, alcoholic fathers and, um, and through the program, a lot of, oh, wow. yeah, isn't that, it's wild. Um and through the program, I've realized that how that can affect me, you know, how being the grandchild of an alcoholic can affect me. The, I'm also the niece of an alcoholic. Um, it's it's um, in, on both sides, my mom's side and my dad's side. It's pretty much everywhere. Um, but I grew up, I'm the oldest of three. So um, I always felt like when I when I was growing up, like I had to be in charge of everything. Um, I'll just share a story with you I've shared before. But um, when I was three, uh, something happened where I didn't get my way. And I really, really wanted something. And my mom said no. And in order for me to get what I wanted, I held my breath until until I passed out. <laughs> And she thought, I know she was terrified. She was really worried. I was this little child and I was that stubborn that I had to hold my breath to get what I wanted. And so she took me to the doctor because she was completely convinced I was going to give myself brain damage. And um, the doctor said to her, you know, some kids are very willful. And what you have to do is just let them let them work it out. He said they will start breathing again as soon as they pass out. And the most I've ever seen a child do this was three times. So not to worry. But according to my mom, I did it seven times. So I was very, (laughs) I know. And so she, and she tells that story all the time. Um, But that was at home. So I remember feeling like I had to get my way. I always needed that. Just, it was really uncomfortable for me, but growing up, to the in the outside world I was always like the people pleaser I wanted the teachers to like me I wanted the friends to like me it was really important that people like me and so it was kind of interesting like being in my immediate family and being this challenging child and then going out in the world and being this easygoing sweetheart and you know it was just very confusing for me growing up we also moved a lot my dad's job kept us moving um, so there was always a lot of, you know, chaos, a lot of, um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. You know, the, do you remember that affecting you very much? In other words, uh, you know, I mean, people, uh, uh, get affected in different ways by moving around a lot. Do you remember anything about that? I do. I remember thinking, I just had these funny memories, but I do remember thinking, being very angry with my parents for not, um, not listening to me, you know, I didn't want to move. I really liked my friends and we moved, but by, uh, let me see here. I think we were in six different States. By the time I went to college, we were in, uh, I think like 13 different houses. So yeah, I do remember. I remember, especially when I moved from California to Seattle when I was like, I think 11 or 12. And that was sort of the end. That's when I decided just to be a rotten child to my parents and you know, I just, mm-hmm. nobody, yeah, it was, it affected me. It definitely affected me. I, I hated it. Mm-hmm. 
So talk about the, uh, so obviously you, have, I, I just heard you talk about your ex-husband, mm-hmm. uh, or I heard you talk about your husband, and I, I, don't, I don't know if there are any other alcoholics that uh, you've had in your life, but what, what kind of um, got you into Al-Anon? Who are the alcoholics in your life? Are you able to give a yeah. uh, kind of a, a description of that? So when I was in college, I joined a sorority, uh, and I remember... I remember I didn't like it, but I really wanted to belong to it. Um, And I, there was, we had this one event that was kind of weird and we're on this bus and I look at this one girl and and she looks at me and she said, that was weird, wasn't it? And I said, yeah, that was so strange. And we had an instant connection and she ended up being, you know, one of my, my best friend. We lived together in college. Um, her, and she, um, she was funny and sweet and I loved being her friend, but she would get so drunk. It was obnoxious. <laughs> you know, it was like we would have fun. And and I always say like, I'm not an alcoholic, but it's certainly not for lack of trying. I, I was right there with her, you know, I was, but I just, I don't know what happened. I, I'm, I, I'm like come from Irish people, but I don't have a very high tolerance for alcohol. I also don't like to feel that out of control feeling at all. So it never really, I'd go to bed or I would just go home. I, it was never something that I would stay out all night and go crazy and, and, and wind up places where I didn't know where I was the next day, but, um, but my roommate did and, um, and it just kept getting worse and worse. And, and it was the same feelings I had that I had with my ex-husband. It was like, what's wrong with this person? What's wrong with me? I don't know. It was just, it's such a, such a, the feeling that I have when I'm close to somebody who's an active alcoholic is the same feeling I sort of had growing up, which is, um, I have to figure this out somehow to make sure that everything's okay. (laughs) If that makes any sense. Um, so yeah, so my roommate and I, uh, yeah. So so, let me, let me dive into that Mm -hmm. a little bit. So when you say you have to figure it out somehow, because you know, I, I I do, I can relate to Mm -hmm. that in uh um from an alcoholic perspective in other words not only i but i hear many people who come into the program they're always thinking about if i could just do enough research and figure out what it is is making me drink um perhaps i can kick this thing right and there's something in there's something in uh even the big book that says uh you know self-knowledge is not going to cut it basically so in your case though from an alan from an alan's perspective you're trying to figure out the same thing, but it's not for yourself. It's for somebody right. else. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. And and that's why when people will say like, I don't understand why you're in recovery. What did you do? What are you addicted to? It's really <laughs> right. hard for me. And I didn't even know what I was in there for. Like I said before, I thought I was coming in to get a couple pointers and be out in a couple of weeks and solve this thing. But, um, it's obviously not what happened, but so, um, so yeah, what I'm in. So what I like to say is, um, for example, my husband in the morning, every morning he would throw up in the shower. I mean, violently, and I could hear it. And I would say, you know, I knew it was going on and he would ignore it. Or if I asked a question, he would deny it. And so I would. Okay. So let's, let's go back with the time okay. down here a little bit, just so I understand. So, okay. So you were in college. I interrupted you there or whatever you're you, happening with your roommate. There. Right. So when did you. So uh, approximately how old were you at that time? And then when did you get right. married? Okay. So I met my roommate. So my roommate, I went to college when I was 18 and I lived there until I was about 23 um, in college. Mm-hmm. And there was always a boyfriend involved too. But um, so I lived there and then, um, so. In, you mean for you? No, or for, for me roommate? and the roommate. I mean, both of us, we were, you know, we were young women and was a, at a party right. school and we were having a great time and. You know, she, but a lot of, a lot of my disease, I think shows up in my relationships, especially with men. So, um, so there's that, but, um, but with my roommate, at least I did find myself being incredibly codependent with this woman and, um, and really holding a lot of resentment towards her. I felt like I was always working really hard to be like this understanding friend. And I always Mm -hmm. felt, you know, that maybe she didn't respect me or she, you know, I just, I had all these, um, 
what they call it, what do you call those, the premeditated re- resentments, you know, expectations on this woman. Right. Yeah. So, um, so we had a, a rocky relationship. It was the relationship sort of like I had been used to having growing up where to somebody's face, everything was fine. But as soon as they left, I was just completely trash them and then feel terrible about myself because I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know how to get out of the, that cycle and, you know, these relationships. So anybody I was close to, I always felt hurt by, and she was a prime example. Um, so, you know, we would break up our friendship and get back together and break up our friendship and get back together. I now know that she was incredibly sick. Um, she, by the by our senior year she had to move back in with her parents and she ended up getting two DUIs and and like the you know it was yeah. really really scary um and we didn't talk for a long time and then i found out she was going to get she was going to get married and we got back in touch and she asked me to be in her wedding and i agreed and at her wedding she was completely hammered and um but i really love this oh. woman you know she's my one of my best friends right. and so when she was pregnant we ended up becoming really close again. And I think now I understand that is to be, she wasn't drinking. Um, I think so. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I asked her to be in my wedding and when she was in my wedding, it was a disaster. You know, she embarrassed, she, she did the basic stuff, you know, like that kind of garden variety uh, stuff where she got too drunk, embarrassed me, said crazy stuff, you know, made out with my cousin, stuff like that. But um, but making out with the yeah, cousin. yeah. So oh, I just goodness. said that's enough, and um, I still remain friendly with her, but I wrote her off, and um, and so my son. So now I'm 28. By the time I get married, my son was born. Okay, okay. okay. so now we're really fast forward. Yeah. So well, let's back up. So now, right, right, right. So when did you meet the husband? How did that? Come I met about? the husband. Hmm. Okay. Oh boy, John. Well, I, I was, I had moved back to Boston. So after college, I was almost married to this other person who I don't think was alcoholic, but, um, it didn't work out and it was really kind of dramatic. And, uh, like a lot of the relationships in my life, it was like fraught with all these really funny issues, mostly me feeling not good enough and taking it out on the other person. But, um, but I, we broke up and when I was, I think 25 and I moved back to the Boston area where I, where I'm from and, um, and okay, I settled in, uh, into my job. I was also a bartender, you know, I, so I hear that in the program, I, I heard someone say once, if you're only in one 12 step program, you're probably not looking close enough. So when I, when I really think about it, you know, I was working three jobs. I've always compulsively worked to like prove stuff, you know, to prove that I'm okay, that I'm worthy. So I was working three jobs, um, I was dating people, but I never really liked them that much. But, uh, one of whom I definitely know was an alcoholic, um, and so I just made a decision. I said, Megan, I'm going to, I really want to just settle down with the next normal guy that I meet, right? Normal. Okay. That first of all, that should have been a warning sign. Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> so I met my husband and he seemed perfectly normal. He was like this nice Midwestern boy. And he was in, you know, he was going to be a lawyer. And I just thought, okay, well, this is it. I just want to get married to this man and live a simple little life. So I moved to the, yes, the the whole nine. That's great. Signed, sealed, delivered. And when I met his family, I thought they were so exciting. You know, they were, um, I've immediately, Uh yes, Uh exciting. I I had this like quiet little family where like I, for Thanksgiving. So the first, when I met my husband and I just, it was, I met him in August and by November, I was already traveling to meet his family for um, Thanksgiving. And my Thanksgivings growing up were really, um, I find them stressful or I found them stressful where it was like kind of this quiet, uh, people sort of like, mm, passive aggressive stuff going on all the time, but no one ever saying anything. And, you know, just everything is like the chairs are hard. The, the food's kind of dry, but they, when I went to my, my husband's Thanksgiving, it was very exciting. They 
were loud and they were partying and there was all these kids and it was like a party. And I thought, this is great. I love it. I went to his parents' house. They had five bars in the house. So I thought, oh boy, well, this is fun. <laughs> you know, they rented this, they rented a limo and we went bar hopping with his parents. All of this looking back in hindsight. Yeah. Maybe a warning sign, but I didn't see it that way. I really wanted what I wanted and I was willing to ignore all of the red flags to get what I wanted. So, so yeah. So, well, so, okay. So when things start to, I guess, tur- make a turn and uh, yeah, okay. So let me go ahead and tell mm-hmm. this story right now also. And that is the reason that uh, Megan is on the podcast tonight is that because I, um, I like to listen to podcasts myself, and uh, I sort of listened to uh, The Recovery Show by Spencer, and uh, Megan was on that particular episode, and I was on a long flight. I was flying from San Francisco, and I was coming back home to, um, uh, to my home, and it was about a four-hour or so flight. And so I decided to go ahead and uh, tune into one of Spencer's uh, podcasts. And Megan was on there. She just happened to read from a pamphlet called, what was the name of that uh, pamphlet, Megan? Uh, How Can I Help My Children? Love it. How exactly. Can I Help My Children? And it was a fantastic, um, uh, I just heard her talk about alcoholism, how it affected her children, how to be age appropriate with her children. Um how she's navigated that with her children throughout her recovery process. And she did 45 minutes to an hour just on that one pamphlet. And she did such a good job of it. I thought I would love to have her on Sober Speak. And so that's why she's here. So if you would, Megan, I'd like for you to, if you could talk a little bit about that pamphlet, um, what it means to you and your kids, um, Talk about uh, some of the incidents, if you will, that led up to uh, your getting into Al-Anon. And you just share as you would like to. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, so that pamphlet, How Can I Help My Children?, really my motivation besides trying to get my husband to stop drinking was the fact that I had a young son when I got into Al-Anon. And I didn't grow up with with alcoholism right in my face as a child. So I thought, I can't have my children do this. How can I help them? So that pamphlet, I just devoured the first time I saw it. Um, but really the motivation for me to, um, to, to share on the recovery show was my roommate, which I've talked about. So two days after my son was born, this is 2011, um, on Christmas, she ended up passing away from the disease in her sleep. She was 70 days sober and she, um, she died. And that's the same roommate. roommate. I didn't, and I felt so awful and I hadn't been in program. I didn't know anything about recovery really. And, and so I was so angry with her and I was so in turmoil because I had a, a newborn with colic and a drunk husband and one of my best friends who was selfish enough to die on me, you know, it, and, and I was having a really hard time yeah. with it. Um, and so it was hard for me to grieve. It was hard for me to be compassionate towards her. And so one of the things that I've done through my recovery process is I can't make a her because she's not alive. But I can, you know, help people, young parents in recovery or parents with young children in recovery. Um, I can help them whenever I feel called or whenever I think I'm called to do that. And so that's why I love the pamphlet. That's why I love handing it out. That's why I love when people read it and they realize they're not alone and this isn't their fault. They didn't cause it. They can't control it and they can't cure it. So I love that. I love this pamphlet. It helps kind of identify the problem. And, um, and one of the things it says in the pamphlet is, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So real quickly, so real right, right. quickly before you go into that, because I, I know that that is a, um, mm-hmm. the three C's, yeah. right? I, uh, there are going to be people listening to this who possibly have not heard of yeah. three C's, right? Cause it, mm-hmm. cure it, control it. Why don't you just just describe those a little bit and what that means yeah. to you? Yeah. So the recovery. three C's. I 
I didn't cause it. I can't control it and I can't cure it. So I didn't cause the, the disease. And that's something that I, fo- I felt like I did. And I was told by my husband and his mother that I did that um, if I only I was nicer to him, he mm. wouldn't drink. And I would think if only I, I if only I could I do something. I mean, it's the insanity of alcoholism living in me. So I was saying to myself, OK, if I cook a certain dinner and he comes home, maybe that won't make him drink. You know, and, and the insanity just spirals. So I didn't cause it. When I heard I didn't cause it, I thought, OK, good. Um, I mean, my ego was a little let down, but at least I had relief, you know. Um, I can't control it. That is a huge problem for me. It always has been, but it's like when I when the act of alcoholism really hit, that control piece of the disease for me, it just took off. So every little thing I thought I had to control. And all I did by trying to do that was to compound the problem. Um, and then I didn't cause it, I can't, and I can't cure it. So it doesn't matter how much love, it doesn't matter what kind of good woman I am, I still can't cure the disease for him. Yeah, or anyone. Right. So if you're out there, you're out there and you're listening to this and you have an alcoholic mm-hmm. in your life, um, those are uh, three good guidelines. I, I didn't cause it, I can't cure it, and right. I can't control it. I'm glad you brought that up. So getting back to the pamphlet, you're oh, going to yeah. say something about that pamphlet. Well, Basically, it just try. helps. For me, the thing that I love the most was that um, that – it's one of the places in Al-Anon where it first tells me that it's not hopeless. So there's a paragraph that says, the first thing for us to realize and accept as parents is that the situation is not as hopeless as it seems. What we say and do can have an effect on the alcoholic as well as our children. We can discover by accepting the help Al-Anon offers um, how to make our family life happier. So that my sponsor always says, you know, the three C's, she'll say you didn't cause it, you can't control it, you can't cure it. But you don't have to contribute to it either. So the the things I was doing by arguing with him, by shaming my husband, by having these huge blow ups in front of our kids, because I didn't think I could, con- I couldn't, because I didn't think I had a choice around the way I reacted to the disease. So I would cause all this damage by having these screaming fits in front of our little kids and scaring them, you know? So I don't have to contribute to it today. Thank God. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about, uh, once again, you know, kind of what maybe got you uh, uh, into, I, I mean, I know that the, so I guess talk about like your first meeting and, you know, what, what, what brought you to that first meeting? I, I know there's a lot of yeah. steps to lead up to that, but were there any particular incidents or anything like that involved with it? That I don't got think you so. You know, that? for me, it was um, a couple things. You, I love what you said about the big book, which I've actually read. Um, but the, what did you say that you can't think your way out of it or something? What, did, what was that quote that you said? Self knowledge is not the uh, so basically self knowledge. Yeah, that's is good. Not the <laughs> so I thought if I could, um, I thought that um, I knew I had this fact in my head that said um, children at the age of three and a half get their permanent memories. So I had a deadline. <laughs> and so my my son was about to turn two, and I thought, oh boy, I, I need at least a year, probably. You know, if I'm really being realistic, right, to fix this guy. So I, so, you know, it was just the like night after night of me locked in the room crying, you know, f- Googling how to stop it and, and getting Alan on over and over. And the only thing I knew in my head about 12 step programs was what I'd seen in movies. So I made a lot of excuses why I shouldn't go. So one of them was I didn't, I thought I'd have to like stand up and talk to everybody, you know, with the, <laughs> just tell them my, my story, um, the first day. Uh, so I, no, I, I had all these, I didn't, I also didn't want to go, you know, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to confront the issue because, uh, I thought that, well, first of all, I thought that a lot of people cared about what happened in my life, that strangers were going to report this, but also in, in the place I was living at the time with my husband and his family, his family, you know, they, they had, a a reputation. And so people knew who they were and their livelihoods could have been at stake in my mind, at least. So, and maybe it's true too, but that was a lot of the push I had against it. Uh, There was a meeting down the street from where I lived with a babysitter in it. 
And, um, and so I always thank any group that offers babysitting because, um, I don't know if I would have gone without the babysitter. There was not a soul who had watched my son and he was almost two. And the first person to ever watch my child was an Al-Anon babysitter. And I was a nervous wreck. I was just a nervous wreck. Mm. Um, but I walked in and everybody was really nice, which made me very uncomfortable. Uh, I was in this weird basement. Um, and there were a lot of people there. And so I thought, oh, this is not for me. It was sort of, I was very angry too. So I didn't want to be in there. Um, nobody was making sense. I can't even tell you what the first meeting was on. I don't even know the date. I have like an approximation, but I have no clue what the actual date was. Um, and at the end of our program, we say that, um, Actually, I'll tell you the one thing that resonated with me. The only thing I really remember from it as in our intro, we say that um, they say we find that living with an alcoholic is too much for um, some of us to handle, for most of us to handle, and that we become irritable and, re and unreasonable without knowing it. And that clicked in my head. I thought, oh, how did they know that? Mm -hmm. How could they know that? It's like I didn't know who I was anymore from mm -hmm. trying to force all these solutions. Um, and then at the end, it said, we love you in a very special way, the same, or you'll, you'll find you'll come to love us in a very special way, the same way we already love you. And I thought, oh my God, you just met me, you know, just back off. So it was, it was not a good first experience, but I don't think anything could have been because I was in so much pain that, um, you know, it was rough, but, and, and I remember going and hiding all the literature. So my husband wouldn't find it. And then a couple of weeks in, he did end up finding it. And I was really nervous. And he said, he found, he found the pamphlet and he found, or like our newcomers packet, which I still have. And, um, in like a phone list. And he was like, what's this? And he says, so Alan on on, are you going to Alan? And I said, yeah. And then he said, okay. And walked away. He just didn't really even acknowledge it. So that was good. But, you know, we were at that point. I think so I have no clue. I think he did. Um, I, yeah, because I had told him a couple of times, you need to go to AA. I, I knew where all the AA meetings were before I knew anything about Al-Anon. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think he probably knew what it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was really determined to get him well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but eventually, you know, they say, try to keep an open mind, which is what I did. And I, I did mm -hmm. eventually really find comfort there because nobody was telling me what to do. And I really appreciated that. And they were listening and I didn't speak at all for the first probably six months. I just would pass and cry a lot. <laughs> yeah, it was tough. So, so, yeah, that sounds tough. So tell me a little bit about your, uh, I guess your kids and the journey they've had through it. I know you talked a little bit about it on Spencer's show. I know you've talked a little bit about it here, but uh, uh, explain to me, because uh, I really kind of, uh, that really caught my attention and you sharing with them uh, age appropriate uh, sort of uh, explanations and going through that process and what your, and what your husband or your ex-husband may have thought about you know, about mm. how to share with them. So yeah, absolutely. So eventually it got to the bit. point where I had to leave. Um, it was just not, it was something that wasn't going to work out. So in the mean, so I, I had to leave the marriage and I had to, to leave, move had to back to where, near where my parents lived because I knew I would need support. Um, the alcoholism was really scary for me. Gotcha. Um, and, and, and so, so what happened was um, I had an, a daughter and when I found out that my daughter was going to be a girl, I, something just completely changed in me because, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, I know, let me, so, so let me go with the timeline here again. So, so, I'm sorry. Right. so you're out, uh, you're living in another state. You already have one boy. Uh, you already have one child as a son. And then how many more years? Uh, like, uh, then, so she's, uh, um, she was born almost two and a half years to the day from my son. Okay. So, so I, yeah. Okay. So, so she's yeah, and I think when I started like, Alan on either, married, I just, right? just found out I was, I think I just found out I was pregnant with her and I call her my marriage therapy baby because gotcha. he was still saying he's not drinking. I'm not drinking, but I, and he, but he would say, she's really angry. And I was really angry. <laughs> and that was, that was something I could not deny. So the, you know, the therapists were like, Oh, try to be really nice. Try to, you know, whatever. So I found out 
when I found out I was having a girl, I knew something inside of me said, I can't raise a daughter looking at me as the example. And so, oh. and so right after she was born, Gosh. I tried more therapy and I was going to different Al-Anon meetings and, you know, I was dragging him to like the AA Al-Anon meeting and he went to one or two, but he said, boy, those people have problems. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was, um, it was funny, but, um, but I saw an attorney because he's an attorney and I, I saw an attorney and I said to the woman, you know, uh, he'll probably get better, but just in case, can you just let me know what's going to happen, what I can do? Because I didn't want to live in a, in that state and be far from my support system. Um, so she said, most of these things don't work out. <laughs> she said um, that, and I thought she was crazy. I, and she said, get, um, get your children into school and get, mm -hmm. um, get a, get housing and get a job and stay there for a year and don't rock the boat, which is really hard for me. Um, so, uh, right. The not rocking the boat part. It was, it's like, it was like it was a tall order, but I decided that's what I should do. I should listen to this woman. And, um, and when the time was right, I, I did end up leaving. But before I left, I made an appointment with my, with their pediatrician. And I said, to this woman, I said, listen, this is what's going on in our family. I, I would really like to know how I can talk to them about this because this is, you know, scary for me. I can only imagine what it was like for them and uh, my children. And, and she just said, be age appropriately honest. And she used the terminology about, you know, you t talking to them like it's a disease, but talk to them like it's a sickness. You don't have to, you don't have to really get into detail, but just say, daddy's sick right now. So, so that I did do. But like I shared on the other show, um, the first time I, I explained that to my son, who when I left, my son was um, three and my daughter was nine months. So, you know, a week or two after I had been back back home after I left the marriage in the state, um, we were on the speakerphone, like the Bluetooth in the car. And my son said, Daddy, are you feeling better and my husband said, yeah, and I started sweating. And my <laughs> husband said, what do you mean? I'm not sick. He's like, mommy said you were sick. And uh, he said, what? Your mom is the one who's sick. And then, you know, I had to turn it like frantically try to turn off the Bluetooth. And, and um, so it went like that for about a year where I didn't know if, if, you know, I still I was so confused about it myself still, you know, I. But the second that I hit ground in the state and I live in the Boston area, when the second I hit ground, I I went immediately to an Al-Anon meeting because I just knew as much as I didn't like the meetings, I knew that's where I was going to find what I needed. I had ha I had come to believe just enough. Yeah. Well, well, hold on a second. You didn't, does that mean you didn't like the meetings you were going to in the, that other state? Or I just, you didn't, just like didn't like the meetings, like the meetings in, general. in general. I was general. still in that mindset like I'm doing all this work. Like I was the martyr, right? I had all this. I'm doing all of this work for this man who won't even right. stop drinking. You know, so I still had that mindset. Yeah. And I know <laughs> that I, I just I know that now I see it for what it is, but which is a ton of fear, really. But but at the time, I was really angry about it. But it sounds like even though mm -hmm. you didn't like the meetings, there was something deep down inside you that kind of said, this is where I right. need to be. This is where I'm going to need to get the help. These people yeah. have been and where I had these I've little been, tiny go, like nuggets right? of encouragement. You know, one of the first times something, a tool in Al-Anon worked for me, it was my right before I left my husband and... I was talking to one woman. I finally opened up and she said, well, listen, if he's trying to start a fight with you, that's kind of one of the tools that alcoholics can use to get to provoke you so they can drink some more. So if he says this, you can try saying you might be right and then walk away and call me instead. And here's my number. And I thought, OK, this lady is crazy. But I tried it and it actually it was like I had diffused a bomb. I couldn't believe it. I was on cloud nine. I thought, oh, my God, I can't believe this actually works. So <laughs> <laughs> so was like those little tiny little pieces of encouragement that I thought, okay, maybe these people know what they're talking about, even though the whole God thing, I don't want anything to do with that. You know, they say, take what you like and leave the rest. I was like, okay, so I'll talk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So hold on, back up there. So are you, 
you have any sort of uh, a spiritual life before you came down on? Was it something from the ground up? Did you have any animosity well, toward so God? I, so my spiritual how, life, how so work? my parents were raised in the religion where you're supposed to feel guilty all the time. And, um, and yes, that's right. <laughs> How'd you know? And then, um, but, um, but, and, and they, they were raised, you know, in the Boston area during the time where like the priests were, were really molesting children. And I think that affected them in a way. Um, so they were really jaded towards that church, but they always seemed very spiritual, but never, they didn't need a middleman for it. Do you know what I mean? They didn't like the church. I grew up feeling like, um, getting, I had the belief that people who had faith were either mm, like they, they were going to be bamboozled somehow, or they were just ignorant. But the truth of the matter is I had, I know, I knew in my heart that I had some kind of protection and I had always felt like there was a power greater than myself, but I had no language around it. And I would never talk about it because how could I, I didn't, I didn't understand it. So my, yeah. In the uh, big book itself, it says uh, deep down inside every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. Uh, it is there and may be blocked by calamity, pomp, or worship of other things, but yeah. it is there. And so it sounds like you had that right. particular that, that, you had that belief. That's a great book. Who wrote uh, that book? No, but, <laughs> <laughs> we think a lot of people they think yeah. God wrote it using Bill Wilson and some others. Yeah, you know, yeah. So uh, I felt like right. that as a kid growing up, but I knew how my parents felt, and so I didn't want to disappoint them. And I actually found out later. I thought I was baptized. I thought I, I thought I did the whole nine. And right before I got married in a Catholic basilica, my my parents said, oh, they're looking for, I was like, hey, do you have my baptismal certificate? And she goes, oh, that was just for your grandparents. You weren't really baptized. And I thought, oh, my God, what, what are you doing to me? So, so, yeah, so I always had the belief that when bad things happened, it was because God was punishing me. And when good things happened, it was because I was being favored by God. And I still struggle with that a lot. I do. But, um. For me too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, uh, the God of, uh, uh, you know, and down in the south here where I live, uh, it's uh, where the, uh, oh, yeah. the God of fire, uh, fire and brimstone, they call it. Uh, you know, yeah. So we get a lot of that down here. But uh, I understand, you know, people, mm -hmm. and, and that kind of goes into the second step, uh, Megan. In other words, you know, it, it's about, you know, coming to believe in that power. And then also the mm -hmm. third step in defining what right. is that power to you, right? What what shape does it take? What mm -hmm. form does it take? What does it mean to you that God as you understand him, right? And you might take bits and pieces of mm -hmm. that God that, that you knew as a child, right? But you may not take it all. It's just like we uh, talked yeah. about at the beginning of this uh, podcast. Right. Take what you want, leave the rest behind. And I know mm -hmm. with a lot of people within the religious sector, mm -hmm. that can seem a little bit uh, sure. yeah like a heretic or something like that. Yeah, but, it certainly uh, worked for me. At the beginning, though, I me. wanted to just take like step one and 12 and like maybe the rest or whenever ones didn't say, you know, <laughs> I didn't really want to deal with the God <laughs> thing because I just thought, well, I'm not, I'm not going to go down that route. I have a better plan. <laughs> so I've, I've, I've had to come to, but coming to believe a lot of it was just these little teensy miracles that happened early that helped me be more willing to finally make that decision to turn my life and my will over and, and, um, and for a child who was willful, who would hold her breath until she passed out. Uh, that's a big deal. You know, I learned in al -Anon, I can make a choice, right? I can make a choice. And that, that a lot of that, um, comes from t a lot of that has just been from slow, slow, slow pro growth in the al -Anon program. But for me, it's definitely very slow. Mm -hmm. You know, I, one of the other reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast is because it was very evident for me in listening to you on uh, Spencer's uh, program that um, you have a – a, a genuine enthusiasm, yeah. almost like a almost like a childlike enthusiasm 
for the program of Al-Anon, and you take it very seriously. I mean, you're, you're enthusiastic mm -hmm. about it, but you take it very seriously. Mm -hmm. I know you like the traditions as well. Um, I know mm -hmm. you talk to me about going to conferences. I know you get to as many meetings as you can. Yeah, and that it is, is correct. Yeah, it's a way, yeah, of, a way life, of life for me. Like um, I just, I'll tell you a quick funny story. Um, so... Uh, another part of me turning my will and my life over is is asking for the help of a loving higher power, caring to be in the care of that loving higher power. So uh, it suggested in Al-Anon that we attend um, some open AA, meeting, AA meetings. And um, our fifth tradition is that we encourage and love our um, our alcoholic family members and friends. And, um, and so, and, and by doing that, it's by learning about the disease of alcoholism. And so I, um, I keep asking my higher power for help specifically around the divorce. And, um, I have like this really, it feels like hate. I still, I still carry that for, we're still married. We've been getting divorced for years, but it, it feels, it hurts me to have, for years, yes, years, years, years. You say for years. Yeah, and so over, it hurts me to carry this around. It is it just well, working out the legal things with the yes kids and no? And it's the that, but also that kind of um, stuff. it's that, but also just like a real dragging of the feet to provide anything truthful. Which that, and also we separated, and then. I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought maybe this could end well. And I, you know, uh, so I thought that maybe we could reconcile somehow. But um, so I had this brilliant idea to bring him to my house. You know, I'd set up all this new life. I was going to all these awesome meetings and I had started even getting involved in fellowship. And and I thought, well, this is good. I'm in a good place. So I'm going to have him come here and um, get better. And he'll see how great it is to live like this. And he'll... You know, I still didn't understand it very well. I still don't understand it very well. But anyway, um, spoiler alert, he didn't stop drinking. And finally, he had to hit his own bottom. And all I did was get in the way. All I did was, was um, continue it, you know, and it was really painful. And the children saw a lot of our fights and they saw some pretty awful things. And so, yeah, I do have like this genuine enthusiasm for Alan because it's changed my life. And, um, okay, sorry, I'm getting all off track here, but let me finish with what I was going to tell you about your show. So I prayed to God. I, we had just had a convention here in Massachusetts and I was praying and it was in the meditation room. And I said, okay, I, I asked a couple different prayers, but one of them was just, please help me lift this hatred I feel for my husband. And then, um, the funniest thing was, um, I get out of the meditation room. I look, check my phone and there was an email and it had your information on it. And I thought, Oh, that's funny. And then when I realized it was um, an AA podcast, I was like, okay, whenever I, whenever I ask my higher power for help, uh, it's always presented in the form of recovering alcoholics. And I find that to be like really funny. You know, my, one of the, yeah, thank you. I love that. So, I know. Yeah, like, um, yeah, that's the best. My, um, well, the last time I asked my higher power for help with this was my husband took all the money out of our account as soon as um, I had to file for a restraining order. So all of the money was gone, even the money for preschool. And it was gone, whatever. All the assets gone. And um, I just, I had to, I, I asked for so much help and I really turned it over. And I, I found a lawyer to do it pro bono. And, um, Eventually, she revealed she, you know, broke her anonymity with me and told me that she was 30 years sober in a program. And I thought, OK, God, I get it. I get it. And mm -hmm. and so I yeah. and, and another time I did the same thing. And I went to an open AA meeting with another Al-Anon woman who broke all the rules. And she was just kind of blurted out, we're from Al-Anon. And I don't know why my son won't stop drinking. And I was like, oh, my gosh, lady, we're breaking the rules here. We're <laughs> be cool. And she wasn't cool. And I wasn't cool. And, you know, no one was crying except for us, you know, it was kind of funny, but, but the, they were so generous at this meeting. And, uh, the woman said, okay, well, why don't we make the topic? Why did I drink? And they all went around. And what I heard was, why didn't I drink? And I heard my husband in somebody else's share and a lot of relief came to me. You know, I felt like a lot of relief. And to me, that's, 
I never knew I could feel relief from this. And that, that was a big deal. Mm-hmm. You know, I've never seen a miracle like a room of people recovering really. And so that's why I feel the power of, I feel the power of recovery. Absolutely. God bless you. Mm-hmm. You too. Mm-hmm. God bless you, Megan. That is fantastic. You know what? Uh, believe it or not, um, we oh, yeah. have, uh, a, I don't know if you're looking at the time, but we've had a yeah. time of, I, I really have enjoyed this. Um, I uh, appreciate you being on the show. Um, I'm uh, excited. <laughs> uh, I, I don't plan on this being the last uh, uh, Alan on. Uh, episode on Sober Speak because uh, mm-hmm. uh, you uh, and folks like you are, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I just have great admiration for. Um, I'm glad to see you uh, uh, taking some forward steps in your life. Uh, you and your kids uh, will be in my yeah, and your ex or your husband. <laughs> uh, you know, I, you know. I want all. I want. I want everybody to 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 find their stride in life. Uh, to be happy, joyous, and free. Uh, to be, um, you know, just to uh, to find the God of their understanding. However, that needs to happen. And, uh, absolutely some of uh, my favorite people um are in a couple different fellowships so i love hearing i love um whenever there are members from AA and, and al-anon groups it's um i think everyone says we're our, our own first qualifier so um you know it's it's just a gift so thank you thank you for what you're doing too really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. Uh, hopefully, we can help some folks mm. out there in this world use the internet for uh, some sort of good, as uh, opposed to a lot of time what it's used for. Can you <laughs> Let's go Red Sox. One more time to say uh, Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I just wanted to play that. <laughs> so awesome. I'm not a Red Sox fan, but I just like to play this. So. All right. Well, God bless you, Ms. Megan. Thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, we'll catch up soon. Okay. Bye-bye now. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, hold on. Hold on. I have to read the uh, – so there? Okay. I have to read my my closing comments. I forgot all about it. Okay. So keep in mind, as Sober Speak, we welcome all your thoughts and feedbacks, uh, uh, thoughts and feedback. Uh, Please contact us at feedback at soberspeak.com or you could just go to soberspeak.com and click on the contact us tab uh, we welcome you to we want to make this a dialogue right I want to hear your thoughts ideas opinions any suggestions that you may have um, and uh, we thank you for your support in whatever form it comes or whether it's been sharing the podcast or your friends or with your friends or just listening in as you are able um, and once again, I'm going to close this out with page 164 of the big book. And um, it says, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit. And you will surely meet some of us, such as me and Megan, as you trudge, I added that part. As you trudge the road of happy destiny, may God bless you and keep you. Until then, keep coming back. It works if you work it. Bye bye now. <laughs>